company, and I just wanted to welcome everybody um, to our facility for your, for your panel discussion. As you can see, there's a set in place. This is for Under Milkwood, which opened last night and runs till the end of October. If you didn't get one of these little flyers when you came in, um, get one on the way out. It will entitle you to $5 off any ticket, student, adult, or senior through, uh, I think it expires on the 10th of October. We'd love to have you come back. It's a beautiful, beautiful production. It's great. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah, some of these people have already seen it, and it wonderful. really is. Uh, it really brings us to life. Um, we just ask you to be please careful since there is a set in place, and the artist who painted the floor has since left. So please be careful with your, your water and your drinks so that nothing spills on the floor. And that's it. Enjoy. Thank you so much for choosing us to have your panel discussion. Thank so you. So we're going. Thank you. Okay. My name is Amy Ferris, and I'm going to moderate this panel. And I just want to say that we women have changed the format a little bit for tonight, which of course is perfection for us. And I'm going to introduce these four extraordinary women. And then we're going to go into a conversation. And then at the, about the 45 minute mark, we're going to do a Q&A rather than an hour and 15, because I think all of you have a lot of questions. And this is an extraordinary opportunity. So Andy Zeisler, I'm going to introduce Andy. She is at the end. Andy is the co-founder and editorial director of Bitch Magazine, Meet Media the nonprofit media organization best known for publishing Bitch, feminist response to pop culture, an internationally distributed quarterly magazine about feminism and pop culture. Her writing has appeared in numerous Pierrot, sorry, uh, newspapers including Ms. Mother Jones, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Washington Post, and Bust. She is the co-editor of Bitch Fest, 10 Years of Cultural Criticism from the Pages of Bitch Magazine, and the author of Feminism and Pop Culture. She speaks frequently on the subject of feminism and the media at various colleges and university. A New Yorker, New Yorker by birth and temperament, she lives in Portland, Oregon with her family. <laughs> Yay, Andy. Robin Morgan, an award-winning poet, novelist, political theorist, feminist activist, journalist, editor, and best-selling author. Robin Morgan has published over 20 books, including the now classic anthologies, Sisterhood is Powerful, Sisterhood is Global, and Sisterhood is Forever, the women's anthology for a new millennium. A founder and leader of contemporary U.S. feminism, she has also been a leader in the international women's movement for more than 25 years. Founder and president, <laughs> founder and president of the Sisterhood is Global Institute and co-founder and board, board member of the Women's Media Center. She has co-founded and serves on the boards of many women's organizations in the U.S. and abroad. Robin Morgan. Tamara Googlemeyer. Tamara currently serves as the executive director of Sisterhood is Global Institute, an international feminist activist and writer on online activism, women and war, and young feminist politics. Tamara concentrates on transforming women's organizations into successful, sustainable nonprofits. She has consulted on fundraising, new media, marketing, and communications, strategies for such national women's organizations as the Women's Media Center, <laughs> Women's Environment and Development Organization, and the National Council for Research on Women. <laughs> and Suzanne Braun Levine, who is the author of Father Courage, What Happens When Men Put Family First, Bella Obzug, which she co-wrote with Mary Tom. 50 is the new 50, and of course, <laughs> inventing the rest of our lives. Suzanne is a writer, editor, and nationally recognized authority on women and family issues and media. She chronicled and fostered change in women's lives as the first editor of Ms. Magazine, and today as a contributing editor of More Magazine. She is a lecturer, appears frequently on television, and is an advisor to several women's and media groups. 
and organizations dealing with midlife issues. She has defined a new stage of life, women in second adulthood. Thank you so much. I'd like to say that um, I'm thrilled to be here. I am thrilled to be moderating this panel. Um, I'm going to keep my statement very, very short. Um, very often we hear who is going to be the next Gloria Steinem. And I would like to say who is going to be the next Robin Morgan? <laughs> who is going to be the next Tamara Guglemeyer? Who is going to be the next Andy Zeisler? And who is going to be the next Suzanne Braun Levine? So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to open this up to a, two wonderful questions that actually Amy and Lee brought up. And so I'm going to actually give you credit for this. The name of the panel is From Front Lines to Headlines. What do you consider to be the front lines of the feminist movement now? If people want to get involved in feminist activism, where are the front lines? And read the headlines. What have been the most significant headlines in feminist history, and what do we do, and what do we want for the future headlines to read? That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Andy. You forget, we're a little older. I already <laughs> forgot the beginning of that question. OK. What do you consider to be the front lines of the feminist movement now? Um, you know, I mean, I, I think the problem with trying to distill what the front lines are um, is kind of the problem with talking about feminism right now because there really is so much going on in a number of different um, in a num number of different media in a number of different forums. You know, I think if you if you wanted to, I think take the most obvious example, it would be online activism and uh, the Web 2.0 as a site of activism. And I do think that's an incredibly uh, powerful and very timely place for a lot of these things to be going on. Um, I think my, my personal feeling is that um, if we just look to the web and social media as the front lines, um, feminism quickly becomes very ahistorical. Um, and so I think it's important with any, whatever we consider the front lines, that we also look back and make sure that these things haven't already been talked about and strategized about in a way that's useful, that continues to be useful now. And to pick up on Andy's point, I think because it is so dis dispersed, the movement, it is in all of us, it is all of us and everyone. Um, I, I believe that's one of the reasons why we have um, regularly one of the headlines that I don't care to see again, which is uh, time often comes up with a cover that says, is feminism dead? Or right. who is the next Gloria Steinem? Well, we are all Gloria Steinems, and we are none of us Gloria Steinems. And in addition to Gloria, there was also Suzanne and Robin and you know, countless other women out there. Uh, so I think it's um, short-sighted of us and ahistorical to, to look at just one person or um, you know, to really, um, rather than look at what we can do or the ways that we all shape and impact our communities um, to, to try to focus on one individual I think is um, not helpful really for this movement. Right. Well I think I think the question implies something that I always worry about which is that there's an agenda and that there is a front line because that's at the top of the agenda. Mm -hmm. I think one of the problems that we have had all along is the assumption that there was some bunch of people sitting down in a secret place writing an agenda. <laughs> and, yeah, we wish, right? And when we were uh, producing Ms. Magazine, people used to think that they could call up the feminist movement, you know, <laughs> that is magazine. And, I, and I think that the essence of feminism is that we make our own agendas and we work together to make it possible to execute those agendas. And I worry also um, about the other side of what um, Andy was talking about, about not knowing history. I think we also worry too much about um, the generations the feminist generations and is 
are there two or three feminist generations and mm -hmm. which ones are living up to the agenda <coughs> and which ones um, are betraying the agenda. And I, th I think it's, ter it's really, uh, I think that feminists from 30 to 90 basically have the same goals. And um, we, we experience them differently, but I think we basically um, are on the same track. And I, I, I always hate to see us get sidetracked with these, um, you know, younger feminists aren't thankful and older feminists are bossy and, um, you know. Um, so I, I, I think I, I worry about the word agenda. And whenever I hear it come up, I think, let's talk about something else. <laughs> I, I guess I would, first I agree with everything everybody said, I'm easy. Um, <laughs> no, I really seriously do, I could just, I would like to sort of take a seat out there and just <laughs> watch them. Um, for me, uh, if I had to say, and it's not an agenda, but if I had to look at, you know, where I think the, a lot of energy is now, I would say four Things I would say it's it's with young women who wait. Were you talking to Christopher Hitchens at the last? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I assure what about you, Mother Just Teresa. I, well, I mean, for one thing, he, he seems to think he has invented the idea that Mother Teresa was bad, and he me, clearly has not spoken to feminists who've been on the case for some time. But that's Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> um, it's pathetic. Uh, but 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 the four 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 areas where where I'm not an agenda, not in priority, just where a lot of energy is bubbling. One I would say is un unequivocally younger women, and I for one am very tired of the media telling us younger women are not interested in feminism. And every time, I mean, t these two women are extraordinary, um, but also so are those two women. And so are, uh, I speak a fair amount and I am not hallucinating the fact that the audience is filled with younger women who are pissed off for all the right reasons. So um, that's one area. Um, another area is uh, older women. Uh, and this is not just a balancing act, but in fact, the baby boomers cresting is that older women are the largest single demographic in the history of this country. Uh, they are the fastest growing users on the internet. Um, they are pissed off and they're smart mm -hmm. and they're experienced and they're taking no shit anymore, quite frankly. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and let's see, that's two. A third is obviously um, technology. And I won't say a lot about that because that's <laughs> one of Tamara's specialties and obviously Andy's already mentioned it, but it is huge, it's humongous. We have never had such a tool in our hands before. But it's globally. only that. A globally. Tool. Uh, it's a tool but it's only a tool. Use. Andy is absolutely right. I mean, unless we're in the streets as well as on the online, we're screwed. Mm -hmm. um, but the fourth, which all of these sort of feed into for me, is global. Uh, the panel that you see here today, and I love these women individually and collectively, I think we're just dynamite, <laughs> but it is not representative of the women's movement. For one thing, you could go snow blind looking at us. <laughs> <laughs> we are very white. <laughs> um, we are also uh, Global North, and that does not represent the women's movement on this planet, which mm. is majority women of color and majority Global South, and angry and alive and growing and glowing for all the right reasons. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but it is transformative and it will in fact transform politics. It's already transforming politics on the planet. Individually here at home, it's not an abstraction, it affects your lives, my life, all our lives, but it also um, will transform the planet and I think is the, without sounding Hallmark card about it, is the hope for the planet. So those, those are areas where I would say not so much cutting edge or agenda, but pockets of energy that are uh, alive and throbbing and quite exciting. Yeah. And, and if we can, Go ahead. If I can just jump in about technology. Um, it is a tool, and I think it's a very useful tool, and it's one of the tools we've been able to use to connect over time and space and uh, across boundaries. But it's nothing if we don't do something with that tool. Mm -hmm. So. At Sisterhood is Global, we have a project called globalsister.org, and it connects women and organizations around the world. Uh, but one of our phrases, or one of our sort of guiding 
missions is to transform online activism to offline action. Because if all you do is sign a petition, Francis and I were talking about this last night, if all you do is sign a petition and you think that's enough, you are dead wrong. You need to get out there, you need to work in your communities, you need to work across boundaries, across borders. Um, you need to reach out to those women um, that you see in the streets and those women that you, you meet online. Um, but there has to be that connection that's made. And um, you know there are ways to do that using the internet, but if all you do is sit behind your computer screen, uh, you know, we're kind of lost. And, and how do not you, done for. How do you think we can change the paradigm of that? Getting women from from out from their computer screens and onto the street, and making a ruckus and and being loud and and changing that dynamic. I think it's beginning to happen already. I mean, I think it comes in cycles, and for for a while in the 60s and 70s, being a street activist and demonstrating was cool. It was hot, it was hip, it was all those good things. Then it became very not cool. And I think it's becoming cool again. And this is an American phenomenon. I mean, right. we just like, we have to realize also that, that what, what Andy was deploying, what Suzanne mentioned as the generational divide, which gets so talked about and hyped, while there are differences in emphasis, um, or in the how, not the what, right. That is also largely a little context, a little perspective, a global North phenomenon, and specifically a North American phenomenon. It, it, when you can be married at age 13 and have three kids by age 17 and be dead in childbirth by age 25, what is a young feminist? Mm. What, you know, um, I tell the story of once having seen a march in Somalia which was led by Forgive my voice, I have a cold. I sound like a sexy dying frog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in Somalia, it, it was led by three women, one of whom was um, a grandmother. She was only something like 38, and she looked to be 92. And, and she, had, she was non-literate. Her daughter was, had had a sixth grade education, and the granddaughter was a physician, was a doctor. Mm -hmm. And they marched arm in arm, leading this march. And a Gen X, Gen Y is completely irrelevant. And, and we need to remember also that that was invented by Madison Avenue, which needs those boxes in order to target markets. So I think, I think trust is part of it. And, and also, now that it's becoming cool again to march, are you all going to the John Stewart March for Sanity? Yes. OK, if not, you should be. Um, when it becomes cool enough to do again, and when it becomes realized that, that activism is a form, is the best fun you can have sitting up. <laughs> <laughs> We're right there with writing for me. Those, those two things. Uh, I think there's activism in activism, and I think young women are designing their own new forms of activism. And uh, you know, um, it's always different. It takes recognizing it each time it comes around. Don't you? Th I mean, you see Don't young you think women. That yeah, and, and I sort of want to connect that to the idea of, of getting back to the idea of headlines. Um, you know, I think a huge, a huge um, struggle and challenge for the feminist movement as a whole and sort of the many feminisms that make up that movement is um, combating what Tamara mentioned, uh, which my, my friend Jen Posner uh, of Women in Media News um, calls false feminist death syndrome which is obviously you know, an epidemic in the media because every few years, um, feminism failed. Why did feminism fail? Is feminism dead? Who killed feminism? Um, in, in the meantime, we at Bitch call it zombie feminism because we've said that feminism's dead, but we've also said that it's harming women. So it can't be both dead and harming women unless it's zombie, zombie, zombie. feminism. Zombie. Um, is that, um, you know, and this is really exacerbated by a sort of 24-hour news cycle, which is a fairly recent phenomenon. Feminists or, or people who are, you know, identify with the movement or are within the movement are put in a position of having to spend so much time correcting the record and pushing back against this idea that feminism is irrelevant or it's damaging young women, that that's actually taking a lot of time away from grassroots on the ground work. It's actually, you know, it's a distraction, but 
it's also part of a struggle for legitimacy, so it's sort of a necessary distraction. And that's a huge problem because that mm -hmm. sucks up a huge amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, and the you know, when the headlines are always, when it comes to feminism, so dismal, um, it's a choice that we have to make. Do we engage with this or do we, you know, push on and do what we're already doing and assume that that is going to eventually get represented fairly in the media? Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that. Well, I think it depends on your arena. It's, you know, we can all fight back the forces in whatever arena it is. If you're a journalist, um, which is where I sort of see myself, um, you've really got to call them on it because otherwise they will say, well, you're not a journalist. And the latest example that just blew my mind was this happiness study. Did you all yeah. see that? Yes. Um, where they had done this study and they found out that women weren't reporting that they were happy. <laughs> which, which reminded me of that, that what the people who were very hostile to early feminists would say is, why aren't you smiling? <laughs> and the answer would be because we're angry. But in this case, uh, happiness was this very bland sort of 50s Hallmark card kind of notion. And women were saying, it was clear from the, all the answers that women were saying they were active, they were fulfilled, they were excited about their lives, they were passionately committed to things. But no, they weren't smiling, honey. And uh, Ariana Huffington and who else, a couple of other people, jumped on this and s basically then took the next step, which was that feminism had made women unhappy. <laughs> and when that happens, um, you just, you know, you say, I'm so tired, do we have to fight this again? But I really think we do. It's, it's in the same league as the abortion issue. It keeps coming up, it will keep coming up. Um, and as tired as we are, we can't let it uh, progress. And um, so I think if you're a journalist, <laughs> you have to do what you're doing. <laughs> And if you can get into the streets or run mm -hmm. for politics or teach, uh, that's, where, that's where the action can be for you. It's, it's a matter of redefining, I think each woman does this individually as, as she comes to voice, as it were. But it's also a matter as the movement continually has to, amorphous as it is, and that's good, redefine itself and, ins and say, no, that's not who we are. You will not define me, us, for us. We will define, because at the same time you've got, it's feminism's fault and feminism is dead, e.g. zombie feminism. Oh, that's great <laughs> wonderful, <phrase>. wonderful phrase. <laughs> Steal it. Um, uh, you have popular feminism coming uh, in the mouths of Sarah Palin. Yeah. Who stands for everything that we're opposed to? Who literally? I mean, who is against reproductive rights? Who is against same-sex love? Who is against equal pay? Who is against? You know, I mean, you name it. If it's good for women, she's against it. And yet she says, "I'm a feminist." Now, this takes faux feminism to some tenth power of stun stunningness. On the other side of the spectrum, in terms of free, wild, and 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 sexy, we just love to be beaten up, and being a hooker is a sign of, of liberation. You have Camille Paglia. So you could go crazy between <laughs> such extremes. And in fact, the sophistication and the, I'll wing it and say profundity of what feminism energy and thought is emanating from more than half the human species. We are not a minority. We are the majority of people on the face of the earth. And this is our voice now being heard across the planet. So we need to take ourselves very seriously and, and call it every time we can. And that's a drag. It is a drag. You're absolutely, mm. it's a waste of time. It feels like we're rerunning the same reel when we should have, my God, we shouldn't be refighting Roe v. Wade now. Um, this is appalling, but to push forward at the same time we're pulling along <coughs> what we thought we'd already won, <coughs> excuse me, is I think the task, and it's, and it's hard. It's hard, I but it's fun. I just realized something, though. <laughs> there is a new army that 
that they aren't counting on, which is older women. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Margaret Mead <laughs> called it postmenopausal zest. <laughs> I, I call it the fuck you 50s. <laughs> but this, it, it's so exciting for me to be, this is what I'm writing about now, is to understand the sense of liberation and fearlessness mm -hmm. and willingness to take risks that women in the, a generation that had been totally dismissed, and we've, all had the experience of walking into that universe and being invisible. But this is a real critical mass of smart, healthy, <laughs> uh, brave women. And I think that a lot of the uh, power to, to hold off those forces is going to come from that generation. And it's, a, you know, it's a, it's a, in that extra 20 years that we, that nobody in history, no women in history have had in front of them after menopause. Right. Um, die. Gives a, they died. That's right. <laughs> uh, gives us a sort of a secret weapon because they're not looking. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I find that very exciting. I actually find that one of the most sort of uh, hopeful things. You get that on the one hand, and you get the, the raised expectations of these younger women and the take no prisoners attitude, the things that made my palms sweat when I demanded them as a, as a young feminist. Mm. Tamara and, and Andy and Amy and Lee take as, as they're given, as they're right, which is what we wanted. But you get that energy combined with this energy. <laughs> 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 It's a, it's, a, it's, a whole, it's a whole new bag. I'd like to quote you, though. I'd okay. like to give a, you said, only she who attempts the absurd can achieve the impossible. Yep. So let's now talk about Sarah Palin. Do and we have to? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, and her, how she is co-opting the feminist. No, she's trying to. Credentials. She's not co-opting. She's, she's, she's trying to. She's trying to. She's trying to. We just can't let her. That's all. We have to nail it. OK. Besides, I think we all attempt the absurd in everyday life, don't you? Yeah, I do. I think we do attempt the As absurd. As women, just trying to get through the day? Go on. It, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's all a bit absurd, don't you think? <laughs> I guess it's sort of a subjective question. Does she feel that she's attempting the absurd? I don't think so. You know, we recognize it yes, as absurd. Yes, we do. We do <laughs> recognize she, it. She, you know, she, she feels like that could, it could totally happen. So, I, yeah, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of dangerous to be on our side thinking, oh, it's totally absurd. It'll never happen. Um, but as it turns out, you know, I, I passed quite a few bumper stickers on my walk down here that said, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's more complicated than that because I, I think that she... To a lot of people, a woman on the presidential ticket, a woman who is out there mm -hmm. speaking uh, daring things in strong language, uh, a woman who's t who uh, calls herself a feminist, uh, I think a lot of people look at her and say, um, I hate to say this, but are inspired by mm -hmm. her. Because she is a strong, independent woman who's speaking her mind. And in a way, that makes her more insidious. <laughs> but I think you can't just say she's not a, you know, she's, she's not a feminist and how dare she call herself a feminist. I can. <laughs> I can. No, I mean, simply because it's the politics of personality um, as opposed to the politics of policy. I mean, feminism means certain, it's not about an individual, we know this, and a type. It's not about, uh, it is about the personal being political. I'll take responsibility for the phrase, but it is not only about that. As, you know, I mean, it's, it's, if you stand for, you can be a strong, plucky woman, plucky wench of the week award to Sarah. She can shoot wolves, helpless wolves from a uh, <laughs> helicopter, and she can skin a moose. Way to go. <laughs> Every woman aspires to this. 
But number one, she's, I don't think she's an independent woman. I think there are, you should excuse the phrase, a vast right-wing conspiracy behind her, or else she never would have got this far. And number two, um, well, I've lost number two. That's a, <laughs> that's a facet of, of being 69. Um, but, but she, the individuality of, of, of any given woman, which is very important and we fought and we fight for that politics, d does not supersede the fact that we are also, um, you know, a runaway child bride in Kenya, a, 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 a sexual slave in Thailand. It's a, it, but there is, the way to change this that we've been developing over hundreds of years, because we were not the second wave, and we're more like the 10,000th wave, uh, is, has been to, to, to see the patterns and to come out of the patterns with some policy. We know women controlling our reproductive rights is a basic. We know it's at the root of racism as well as sexism because ethnic purity is uh, necessary to own, then it's necessary to own the woman's offspring. We know that economics are also at the core. We know certain things. And if you're against all those things for women, I don't think you have a right to call yourself a feminist since you, just because you are a plucky wench. And I think we have to name that and name her. The same people who said, who hated Hillary for being, for saying, yes, I'm a feminist, love Sarah Palin for claiming she is one. That tells you that feminism is not what's at issue. Right. It's not, it's not what's at issue. I think the idea of choice, the word, I, I, this is one of, one of my pet peeves, I think, in the, in the years since I've been, I, you know, I've been identifying as a feminist since I was 16 and I'm almost 38. I feel like the word choice has become co-opted to a point mm. where, you know, it, it's essentially meaningless. Um, yes. You know, and, and I, I feel that that is, you know, Sarah Palin is sort of the inevitable result of that. Um, you know, for instance, I'm married. Uh, it was my choice to get married, but would I say that marriage is de facto feminist because I as a feminist chose it? No, absolutely exactly. not. It's not a feminist institution. Um, the same thing is true of, of, of so many things that have become under this huge uh, big tent, maybe too big a tent of feminism, um, sort of okayed as feminists because individual women choose them. Well, that doesn't make them feminist. Mm -hmm. And Sarah Palin, you know, for as many individual empowered choices as she may have made, is doing her damnedest to roll back um, women's autonomy and women's rights. There's no way we can call that feminist. And there's no way you can call that feminist and for feminists to say, oh, okay, well, I guess she does belong under our big tent. That's just doing ourselves a disservice. Um, so I think, you know, maybe it's not the worst thing in the world to be a little bit exclusive about who we consider feminists. <laughs> I think you know? that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> We've got more than half the human species anyway. We don't need Sarah Palin. <laughs> I think Suzanne's right, though. I think we have to take her very seriously as, as, uh, as a symbol that will be used, is being used against us. Which brings us to... Well, yes, the segue. <laughs> it brings us to the headlines of Frontlines to Headlines, which is what would you like for the future headlines to read? Uh. <laughs> oh, <Sam>. Women <laughs> win. <laughs> Women, women save planet. That would be nice. Tamara? There still is a planet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Let me think. Okay. Suzanne? I have to think, too. Uh, I think because where I'm going is that we shouldn't be in the headlines because it's all taken for granted. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's nice. <laughs> that's really cool. I mean, I hate to use the word mainstreamed, but at some point, I'd, you know, I'd like this to be considered mainstream. mainstream. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Andy? You know, <laughs> the only thing I can think of is a fake headline from The Onion, which <laughs> is w women now empowered by everything a woman does, which <laughs> just is sort of where we're at right now. It, and it goes back to this sort of corruption of choice. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think that's the interesting thing about feminism is like there's really no way. It's unlike a lot of other social movements, there's no real finite end mm -hmm. to it. It's an ongoing project. Um, 
and you know, like Robin was talking about, let's say, let's say the, the next headline of the New York Times was, everything in U.S. now totally cool. <laughs> that, that would be a great headline. But then there's a whole, the whole rest of the world. Um, and yeah. that's our, you know, that's our project as well. I so. think, which is what Robin uh, was talking yeah, about originally. Exactly. I think we've also been caught up in this whole d d argument has sort of been muddied by identity politics because we dissect ourselves over and over to the nth degree so that soon we're just one tiny sliver. And it's really hard, I think, for us sometimes to see across those slivers or to, to envision all of those slivers making up one human being. Um, and it, it ignores and contradicts the structural issues that, that Robin has mentioned. So, you know, if we focus on, well, we're just this type of feminist or we're just mm -hmm. that type of feminist, then it's really hard for us to see across those borders and boundaries. Uh, and, and to be the, the vibrant movement that we are and to represent ourselves that way. And you brought it up earlier, sisterhood is global. You wanted mm -hmm. to talk about the global aspect. And I think that that's very vital at this time in our lives. Well, I'll do, I'll do a very short around the world in less than 80 <laughs> seconds. You um, can do it for longer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I've been babbling too much already. Um, uh, just again for perspective, we are the majority of the human species. 90% um, of all refugee populations are women and children. Um, Two-thirds of the world's illiterates are women, and while the general illiteracy rate is rising, for women it is falling. Um, we, health impacts on women more than it does on men because our bodies undergo more changes, uh, and also because we are the poorest of the poor, the feminization of poverty, um, because we are labor intensive, because we are the ba basic caregivers of the world, uh, of the elderly, of the dead, of the aging, of children. Um, we are the environmentalists of the world. Women are the primary fuel gatherers and water haulers of the world. So environmental destruction or toxic waste or pesticides or um, atomic fallout or acid rain impacts first and worst on women who are heard from least and last about solutions. Um, this, these toxic elements uh, show themselves first as cancers of the female reproductive system. So that in the Pacific Islands where you're still suffering from atomic fallout on the atolls, um, this testing has stopped, but women are still giving birth to what they call jellyfish babies, children, infants mm. born with no spines. Thus, that's a primary feminist issue in the Pacific Islands. I like to say there are no issues that are not feminist issues. When people take to use the phrase women's issues, it makes me crazy. Because there are all issues are our issues since we're the majority of the people on the planet. Urban to rural migration affects women more because either we're left behind to work on arable land, um, when agribusiness comes in and gives tools and money to men but not to women, or else we migrate to the cities trying to follow the men. Uh, but we are considered less educable and less employable, so we wind up in one of three jobs uh, as prostitution um, or sexual slavery, uh, as in factories for less than one dollar per US, US dollar a day, um, or as in domestic servitude um, for even worse and with battery. To be. I won't even go into issues such as female genital mutilation, which was also practiced in the United States up until the 1940s as a cure for lesbianism and masturbation. Uh, I won't go into female sexual slavery, I won't go into the slave trade, I won't go into child brides, into p sati, into purda, all of which are ongoing even as we speak. Um, the good news is that women in, around the world are not, they don't have the luxury, I'm not saying that we are um, indulged and I don't intend to get into or let anybody else here get into because we're continually lured there, first world guilt, uh, or that we have it so much better, how can we must do something for the poor wogs over there because we're not oppressed. Bullshit. We are all in the same play. It's just we have different sets, different costumes, sometimes different dialogue, but the plot is dismally the same. And so whatever a woman does for herself and for her sister here resonates, mm -hmm. but it also resonates in as well as out. And to be involved now in the global women's movement is, for me, 
not the only thing I'm involved in because I'm still a U.S. activist, but, uh, but is the most exciting aspect of things because Dalit women, the new name for untouchables, are organizing. Um, be, the, the, the previously lowest of the low, the unheard of, the unseeable, the untouchables, and they're angry and they're moving and they're doing so as women. They have made all the same collect connections. And that, I think, seriously, is an unstoppable force. But we're part of it. We're like one tile in a vast mosaic. And I don't find that that lessens our involvement. I, for me, it, 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 it's like a pan back. And there is this widescreen, vibrant energy that, is, that we're a part of. And when we la seem to be lagging here in this country, it's alive somewhere else. And we can actually catch it from someplace else and that is, has both a humbling effect, which as Americans, leave aside women and feminism, but as Americans, we, we could use a little humility, but it also has a reinfection, and it's coming this time from Ghana and from Argentina and from the Solomon Islands and from Canada and from Iceland and from Sudan. I mean, from women in the Muslim world, feminists in the Muslim world are among the most courageous, extraordinary women I know, as are the Israeli feminists who are for peace. And when the Scud missiles are dropping and even the male peace activists stop talking, the women march arm in arm. That to me is part of feminism and it's part of hope of the world. So. Um, the Sisterhood is Global, the book and the institute, which Tamara now runs, and using the, the, the internet for the tool for communication across time and space that it, we hope next year to do the first online world feminist conference against fundamentalisms, mm -hmm. plural, because they exist in every religion. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a tool for women. We hope to have a website when we can raise the money. <laughs> that will be in five languages and 24-7. We're nowhere near that, but that's the tool that I, before I kick off, would like to leave in women's hands. You know. In your hands. In your hands. Bye-bye. We're going to, on that note, we're going to actually open it up now to questions and answers so that we have a little bit more time than... We'll ask minutes. the questions you have. <laughs> and so, please, if anybody has a question, just ask. Yes. Um, well, thank you for the wonderful panel. If so many things to say, um, I think I want to pick up on Andy's great remark about you know feminism. Feminism is not the same as a you know independent woman who thinks for herself or doesn't. Uh, and I really agree. And one of the things that I've noticed, I keep listening to what people say feminism is, and I've noticed that a lot of people equate feminism with femininity. <laughs> And I think this is like a crucial issue that we have to really start discussing and explicitly in those terms. It, just because you're a woman doesn't mean you're a feminist. Mm -hmm. And a feminist is not attacking your femininity. You know, to say you're not a feminist is not to say you're not female, which is the way it's translated. And, uh, and that if you are a woman, you have a lot to figure out before you, can, you are a feminist. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to the panel is, um, how do we deepen that conversation? Because I, ha I don't hear anybody, you know, unpacking this in public in any sort of assertive, strong way. Maybe I've just missed it. But it seems to me if we're going to, in order to have feminism be meaningful again, we're going to have to tackle this topic. I think it's definitely being unpacked. Yeah. Um, and the places I've seen it, I think, most interestingly unpacked is by people who identify as transgender, mm. um, even those who, you know, aren't, maybe aren't, you know, physically transitioning um, into, you know, from a man to a woman or a woman to a man. I feel like that discussion comes up a lot, um, and it certainly comes up a lot at, at Bitch because a lot of times when we write about feminism, um, we do automatically equate feminist with woman yeah. um, at sort of mindlessly forgetting that there are a lot of people who don't identify as, as women who do identify as feminists. Um, I think a lot of really interesting theory is coming out of um, trans activism right now and you know some of it is, is I would say you know a, a majority of it is probably happening online um, but there's you know there was an excellent book by a woman named Julia Serrano that came out a few years ago and I'm forgetting the name 
but it's on it's in Seal Press published it and uh, Julia is a male to female um, transgender identified person who really has a lot to say about um, the intersections of trans identity of femininity and of feminism and of the ways that those distinctions um, often get overlooked in sort of mainstream discussions of, of feminism and identity politics. So I'll say that. I think what you, what you raise, th by the way, this is Louise Knight who has written brilliantly about Jane Addams of Hull House. And if you haven't read her work, you should. Um, has a new book out, yes? Yes. Yes. Say it. Say its name. It's uh, called Jane Addams' Spirit in Action. And among other things, it's the story of how Addams became a feminist. Aha. Mm -hmm. But I think what you, what you raise speaks very much to what Suze was talking about in terms of the confusion over Palin. Right, exactly. Because one of the reasons exactly. that she gets away with saying that is, I mean, and, and, and Rush Limbo says, right. now there's a feminist for you. <laughs> she's got great legs and she's a mom. Yeah, right. and she's <laughs> Yeah. Right. So the inity and the ism right. is like a big typo looming over our lives, right. <laughs> um, and it take we need to constantly clarify it. You know. Yeah. But at the other end is the whole I'm not a feminist, but I mean we right. have the luxury right. here of all nodding at the word feminist. But at most um, mm -hmm. groups, you have you are sure to find somebody who finds the word offensive. Yeah, both. And we spend so much time defending it or trying to come up with an alternative or trying to explain. I just read a wonderful novel uh, called The Post-Birthday World. It's a wonderful yeah, Lionel novel. Shriver. Lionel Shriver. And I love everything about this book, but the main character, peri like every 30 pages, says, well, I'm not a feminist because I have a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> and here's this woman who's written a fabulous novel with a great, interesting character. Why does yeah. she have to do that? I can't understand it. It's like, so at the one end is feminine, well, right. <laughs> and at the other end is I'm not a feminist, but. Right. I, think it's a, I think she does that because, I'm not saying she specifically, <laughs> but I think that happens because it's like sending a signal safe, safe, <laughs> right. to men. Uh, I'm not one of those feminists. Right. I'm not one of, you know. And, and I've reached a point, if Andrea, the late dear departed, much missed Andrea Dworkin used to say, I'm a feminist, not one of the safe ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I've reached a point where, in terms of somebody like Palin or Pagni, damn right I'll fight for the forward feminism. And I'm, it's a, if you know it's social history and it's history and social justice, I can't imagine why anybody would not want to identify with it. Nonetheless, it still is the F word. And while I'll fight for it as a movement, I've given up trying to, in, 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 with an I'm no feminist but woman and then everything that comes out of her mouth afterward right. is pure feminist. You know, I don't care. Right. If she wants to call herself squirrel, <laughs> it's perfectly fine with me, as long as she stands for women. Right. I mean, in, in that sense, I'm... I, and I'm speaking lost. globally, feminism or feminist as a title or an identification is, is not one that's used widely in some areas Women's of the rights. world. Muslim, the Muslim world in particular. They'll use it privately among themselves, but they won't use it publicly. Mm -hmm. It'll just well, and I just want to make a plug for a wonderful new history of feminism, by the way, which traces, among other things, the introduction of the word feminist into, you know, uh, American language. We got it from France around 1900, 1910. Um, and that's, it's a book called The Feminist Promise. Mm. And it came out in May. It's by Christine Stansel. <coughs> and um, it's fantastic, let me just put it that way. So uh, I, I, I think that reading the history of women's rights movement, which yeah. is what it is, right. um, it is really enlightening too to help clarify. Yeah. But before there was the word, there was the uh, there activism. Was the, yeah, the 12th century, right. there yeah, was absolutely. activism. Absolutely. 9th century. Right. It's more, it's, I may care more about the concepts of the, the core meanings than the word yes. itself. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not femaleness, it's it's women's rights, or yes. it's what we can do, can't do, how we are viewed in the world. That's what the issue is. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to thank you for bringing the F word to this album. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always say if I could find a fourth feminist in this area, 
We can play bridge. <laughs> what is your name? <laughs> what is your name? I don't know where we are. We'd love to have a party. Okay, let's see can a we show of hands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Somebody should pass around a, no, yeah, pass a sign around up sheet. Notepad, a sign up yes. sheet. <laughs> yes. And what is your name? Marion. And I'm doing a very absurd thing. I'm a retired older woman who decided that what am I going to do with the rest of my damn life? I'm finishing my PhD. Good for you. Marion. It's one of the most difficult things sometimes to explain that because it is so utterly absurd. No, it's you know. brilliant. I know it's. Br I know. I You're attempting the impossible. <laughs> You're going to achieve the absurd. Yeah, exactly. Here you go. Sign up sheet is starting. I'm an organizer. I can't help it. But you have to come to me because I'm wired. Yes. Yes. Thank you. It's wonderful to meet you. My name is Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Um, I actually have um, kind of a okay, topic that I wanted to talk about. Um, last summer, I put on a festival called Lady Fest, so which I found out for some reason. <laughs> about six hundred dollars for the women's resource center and it was basically an art and music festival um, that I came across in research um, during the festival I had a lot of men coming up to me and wondering what their position was at the festival and um, <laughs> over the years of like studying feminism and a lot of books and articles um, I mean I've encountered a lot of articles like Kurt Cobain considered himself a feminist Ian McKay considered himself a feminist where do you think men come into play in defining what feminism really is. I'm always really here. <laughs> I do. Do you? I don't care. But I mean, like, it's about um, equality, right? Suzanne? No, it, it, <laughs> It's an I old question. <laughs> no, but I think of the Women's Music Festival where they had these rules where male children over seven weren't allowed, and then the transsexuals mm -hmm. began to the have Michigan a problem. I mean, yeah. All it proves is that exclusionary behavior um, creates problems. Now, there are always men who are trying to get in just to make trouble or make fun of you <laughs> or to humiliate you, That's, but that's the way it is. But I don't know, other people may disagree, but I just think um, if they seem to be well-intentioned, there's no, as long as it's a woman's thing, they're outnumbered. And maybe they will pick up some of the as long, energy. As long as the men who are present and involved don't then co-opt mm. The event or the movement. There. Yes, there's a deeper point there that that, that is let me preface this by sisterhood is global and, and, and the rest of the world that isn't, you know, above the middle of the economic spectrum in the right. US, white, um, you know, high, has higher education. The rest of the world of women has a long way to come um, to be equal to where men are. But but other than the fact of, of what we give up to, to raise children, um, you know, there's not that much. Um, would be, you know, we're relatively there, but what the piece of the pie that's missing right now is that men don't have equal rights at this spectrum. Uh, men can't stay home and take care of their children because it's not socially acceptable and because they can't get, get in most companies cannot get the, the paternity leave that, that women can get. Um, Do you see men organizing they around don't that? For it. Yeah, they don't exactly. fight for it. I mean, Why aren't the women feminists embracing them as being part of the equation? You know, this happened in Sweden. I think we are. Yeah. We, we really are. And, yeah. it, you know, obviously Suzanne wrote a book about it. Um, there are a lot of people who, who are writing about it and, you know, it seems to me well, that's like the next evolution well, right now is, 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 is that... Feminism is transformative. Yes. I, I teach a course called uh, Counseling Boys and Men from a Feminist Perspective. Mm. And the guys in the class, it's transformative. Mm. They, they haven't seen outside the box. And so until we educate them to what's out there, because I think as feminists, we we hold the secret to change a lot of things in this world. <laughs> we, hold, we have the information, we've been raised, we understand relations, we understand equality. That's a lot of pressure though. Jessica, I mean, you know, your, we only I, have so much time. Question answered a little? <laughs> but I think it's possible. I, I 
guess so. I just, um, I think that there's just like a lot of men that um, are well-intentioned and yes. want to help out the women's movement, and I don't think that they should just be tossed in the wayside. And um, I mean, just like a lot of women get stereotyped for being like like man haters or yeah. whatnot, for mm -hmm. just be like saying that they're a feminist. I think that. Um, I mean, of course, then the, the men get stereotyped too, and I don't think that we should just totally disregard them because I do think that there's a lot of men that do want to help change things for women and make um, everything equal and be able to talk about and discuss those matters and kind of evol evolutionize things. Okay, my sense, I, but my I, sense is that if, uh, you know, if they want to bring a dish to the potluck, I am more than <laughs> willing to share it, but I am not going to cook for them, and I am also not going to, you know, go out and necessarily tackle them in the street and ask them to come in oh, yeah. to my well, potluck. Well, here's where so. I think men's role is, and, and I, you know, I really wish I saw more of this. Men's role is in educating other men. Mm -hmm. Men's mm. role is yeah. in speaking up when their friends make a sexist joke. Yes. Men's role exactly. is organizing yeah. a chapter of Men Can Stop <laughs> Rape at their college. Um, men's activism is, you know, calling up a sports radio talk show and saying, you know what, I'm really tired of you making these sexist jokes about mm -hmm. Tiger Woods' mistresses. Mm -hmm. That's where I believe... How about doing the dishes when we get home well, from work? Well, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm saying no, on, you know, in, yeah. in a lev on a way where we can work towards society not seeing feminism as a zero-sum game, that what elevates women necessarily denigrates mm -hmm. men, because that's mm -hmm. not true. Feminism yeah. is good for men. And if we could, as a society, realize that it's not emasculating, um, they're not going to lose anything. I think, you know, yeah, men, men shouldn't necessarily be saying, what can I do in the feminist movement? They should be looking around and exactly. looking at their contemporaries and saying, I see what I might need to do here. Well, especially in the workplace. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned, um, uh, you know, yeah. being able to stay home, take kind of family leave. That is where, it seems to me, the revolution for them is. I, when I was writing my book, I, I met lots of men who sneaked out the back door to go to a teacher conference or a, a soccer game. I met one man who took his child to the park, and the other women in the park called the police because they thought he was a, a molester. Wow. So, I mean, wow. Andy's absolutely right. It's almost lazy of them to say, how can I help you? The hard yeah. part is to confront each other. And it seems to me, here's, here's my fantasy, is that the younger people in the workplace will join with the older people in the workplace to transform the workplace. If that could happen, all of the questions about uh, what do we do with the rest of our lives would have interesting answers. And the family issues would have interesting answers because women still are making less than men, mm -hmm. 77 cents or whatever, partly because we have to take, a, take time off. It would be, that's where I think the co-ed revolution really lies, and the intergenerational revolution really lies. And just as a PS to, to these things, um, which I couldn't endorse more heartily than I do, uh, I'm the mother of a son, a grown son, uh, a man. Um, and so I would add that, that for men to say, why don't you organize us, is to ask us to do what we've been doing already for 10,000 years. And it's time to say, Herman, pick up your own socks. That's, but, 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 in the inclusionary uh, aspect of this, uh, it's not up to us to include. It's precisely what Andy said and what Suzanne said. Men should be doing it just like sisters are doing it for mm -hmm. us. Men should be doing this hard work for themselves, yes. and they will learn in that process. But I think just on this, a tiny note on the vigilance front, um, and it has nothing to do with individual men whom we may love in our lives and trust, and you know, it has to do with power 
It has to do with a sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. As white folks in racist societies, we have a sense of entitlement. Whether we try to divest ourselves of it or not is another whole issue. But for example, with the White Ribbon Campaign, and again mm -hmm. I'm picking deliberately an example from the International Women's Movement. The White Ribbon Campaign was a, a memorial about the um, mass murders in um, Montreal uh, t now 15, 20 years ago at the Polytechnique. Um, women had organized it, women were raising funds for the families of the victims, it was a women's thing. Um, men wanted to help. It seemed such a, wow, how, good, how great can this be? Um, men were formed, in, formed an auxiliary. They began raising money for the women. After a while they thought, well this is really bad, we should be raising money for ourselves because men are oppressed too. Men are not oppressed. Men are dehumanized by sexism, but they are not oppressed by it. Oppression is something that rapes you, that kills you, that chops you into little pieces, that sells you when you are 12 years old. That's what oppression is. That is not happening to men, at least not in the first world. It sometimes happens to little boys in the third world. But what it does, like racism of uh, doesn't oppress white people, but it dehumanizes us. It makes us less than the full human beings we can and should be. That's what sexism does to men. So to be unaware of the sense of entitlement and not to watch for it is dangerous because the white ribbon campaign in Canada was destroyed over this. And be careful. It's not individual men's fault, it was power. I do think that in this world we have made a lot of progress and I'm living proof of that. I own my own home, I have a, a good job. But I was really shocked with the Kagan nomination process about every day there was an article about obsessed with her being child free and you know, would she be a good uh, Supreme Court judge because how could she make decisions about women and children, you know, she's not. I, do you think that, and I think this is a, a very American thing that America is sort of obsessed with motherhood and kind of fears single women who are older. And also, as younger women coming up, do you, I think they're still, we're still kind of, well, not young anymore, but the younger women are told that you, can, you should have it all. You should have this amazing career and be able to raise a family. And are there still challenges there? Can you answer that? I think I'm the only one who's childless on this panel, Child except free. for, true, thank you, child free, except for my friend Amy over here. That's true. <laughs> Um, I, I do see, uh, I have, I don't think I've experienced it personally, um, at least not in my immediate family, I'll say that. Um, although I have experienced it at work. People have said to me, I've worked in the corporate world as well, which let me tell you, that was a thrill. Um, <laughs> and I, I would have people ask, you know, why don't you have children? I was partnered at the time. They said, well, you know, how does your partner feel about this? All of those sorts of things. Um, so I do think there's a cult of motherhood in the U.S. that is particular to the U.S. Um, I, I don't see that in other areas of the world because, frankly, they don't have the option many times. Um, and I think there is still the superwoman syndrome. Um, and I think, in part, that's what Palin, not to take it back to Palin, but I think that's part of what she's tapping into. Um, that, that um, you know, the myth of the superwoman, uh, that she can be this fabulous, however you define that, mother, uh, and go out and, you know, run Alaska as well. Um, I, don't, I don't think any of us can have it all, honestly. Um, and so I think that, you know, for us it's a series of negotiations. Um, how we how we determine our our own lives and and how we set that up, um, but for me, I, I you know I think that's it's another diversionary sort of tactic uh, in terms of you know media and becoming feminist and you know uh, well if we're feminists then that means we have to be everything for everyone well that's not possible none of us are everything for everyone so I think there was a hidden agenda also with Kagan. Uh, even beyond the motherhood thing, and it was, why wasn't she married? Mm -hmm. yes. And the ultimate statement about that was made by Barbara Mikulski, Senator Mikulski, some years ago, who said, tell me if I'm getting this wrong now. <laughs> it was wonderful. She said, well, a woman in public life, if she's married, she shouldn't really be in public life because she's, you know, disrupting the family and her husband. If she's divorced, 
then no wonder because she was not a good wife. <laughs> if, he's, if she's a widow, obviously her being in public life killed him. <laughs> <laughs> and if she never married at all, there's something funny about her. <laughs> I think that was the real hidden agenda on yeah. Kagan. That's wonderful. I think maternalism and, and capitalism are really at odds, um, particularly in this country. And there's a, a fantastic book by um, Susan J. Douglas uh, called The the mommy myth, mm -hmm. um, Susan J. Douglas and Meredith Michaels, um, where she actually talks about you know the sort of um, slow evolution of you know the kind of cult of motherhood um, moving from you know a time when mothers were very self-sufficient and, and believed to know what's best during a time when mothers were sort of um, supplanted by so-called experts, most of whom were male. Um, through a time when the government actually, you know, started to care in a bill that was, I believe, killed by Nixon. Was that the one? The child care yeah, bill. Yeah, the child care yeah. bill. And, you know, into this, into this <coughs> time, we really fetishize motherhood, uh, particularly when it comes to celebrities, but we have absolutely no... Um, support systems We have no support that. systems, and we refuse to acknowledge that it's a systemic problem and not an individual one. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you hear about women like oh, well, you know, it's her problem. She just can't balance work and motherhood. Well, it's not her problem. It's the problem of an incredibly um, corporatized capitalist society that sees no value in, you know, making family-friendly policies. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I actually don't know if that answered your question. But <laughs> it's, just, it's a great I, answer. I feel like it's, it's, it's you know, that, that needs to change. Yeah. Yes? Um, I was wondering if we could talk about Hillary Clinton, just to counteract all the pavement that's in my brain right now. Um, what is your opinion on, on why she lost, and maybe your opinion about her? And I just want to tell everybody, we have about five minutes left, so that's a great question at the end. I was sitting here plotting the whole time. <laughs> great question. I don't want to leave here without bringing that up. I think it all boils down to it wasn't time yet. Um, I, lost, I lost a bet with Gloria over this um, because I said we were going to do it this time. And I'd won once before when, I said, when she said she's not going to win for Senate, and I said, yes, she is. And I'd won that one, so it made me, you know, heady. <laughs> um, and uh, many different things. I think she listened to Bill. I think, yeah, no, I didn't mean that. I meant, I meant that what Gloria's position was was that everybody will get there first. Everybody, race will triumph, ethnicity will triumph over women. G gay rights, gay marriage is going to be, gay, gays in the militaries, it's all going to happen for, we are the big one, we are the last one, we are the ultimate one. I might add, I think, children's rights loom behind that. And of course there's animals and trees, and, but you know, I'm not overlooking those things. But I think it was a combination of things. She, she listened to Bill, who himself is a Barishnikov of politics. <laughs> Um, he's a genius. I mean, you got to give him that. He can't keep himself zipped, but still. Uh, and and but she, I mean, she went with Mark Penn. When she when she spoke briefly in her own voice, mm. she had it, mm. and then she lost it again. And I think, uh, I think that's the tragedy. But I also think when I mean it wasn't time yet, the vociferous opposition, the viciousness of that. I wrote a piece called Goodbye to All That Too that went viral around the web in which I just tried to name some of the things that were happening to her. Um, and it was so opposed, even by some within the women's movement who could not, who, who didn't want to, fa who didn't, you know, that it astonished me, the opposition to it at this stage. I would have thought some of that was just obvious. So I still have hope she'll come back. I think she's positioned, I don't think she's done yet. I don't think it's a done deal yet. Is that or so I. Info? No, it's just hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's eternal feminist, keep hope alive. You know. But others may feel differently. I, I would, I don't, I'd like to well, hear we'll from them. We have one more question. One more question. And actually we'll do two, if they're <laughs> really short. We're gonna go with you. I don't know if it's short, but um, <laughs> early you were talking about the importance of connecting technology and um, 2.0 with activism on the streets, and I mm -hmm. just read an article this morning by Malcolm Gladwell about that very mm. issue, and um, he was basically saying that the technology doesn't do it because we have sort of acquaintances <laughs> through Facebook or whatever, that that sure. doesn't do it, that 
we have to sort of go back to what really worked for activism, especially civil rights, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. he connected it to friends, that people who had friends who were doing something were so much more likely to get involved. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of wondering, like, what do you see as um, important ways to get us off of the computer and into activism? Right. I mean, I know right. that it's back and forth. Well, I think, well, I'm not familiar with Gladwell's piece, but I will look at it. Uh, and this is another thing Francis and I were talking about last night. It's the face-to-face -face connection that really does it for people. And I think that what you have to do is find that in your local communities as well. In other words, the internet for me is a, a, is a vast, powerful resource and tool but it's only that. And so you really have to make that, you have to embody that in some fashion or capacity. So if you meet a group online, you know, make meetups in your local communities. Um, arrange for that face-to-face -face time because it, it, it is this direct, this face-to-face -face contact, I think that is the power of social justice movements um, traditionally and will be going forward. So mm -hmm. the internet, is both, I think, you know, a gift and a curse in one sense because um, we, as I said, we sign a petition and we feel like we've done something, but in fact, we've only signed a petition and it's going to take much more than that. Um, so for me, I would encourage you all to find that piece of paper that's going around, make sure your name is on it. Find the people in your local communities that you can identify with. Um, they are out there, we are all out there. And what you need to do is make yourself known and visible, and you know it, it's it, people will glom on. That's what happens for me. And one more question. I wonder if you speak to this issue. My name is Carol. Um, in the '70s and '80s, I would spend a great amount of time vilifying Phyllis Schlafly. I hated her, but Phyllis Schlafly was an attorney and mounted some serious arguments. And one of them was women in the military. I'm finding with this cadre of women now, Sarah Palin, um, Christine O'Donnell, Sharon Engel, oh. intellect on the other side is diluted. <laughs> <laughs> and I really want to know how serious this is, and are we, are we really, are people really going to vote for these people? <laughs> some people, I think some people are. Some people are. Some people are. Um, I, I think it's important to poke holes in their arguments. I think it's important not to debate. The, I mean, I personally would never debate Schlafly. And Schlafly was so um, uh, disingenuous that she, you'd meet her in the green room because then they'd ha I'd force them to have us on separately because I wouldn't debate her. She always wanted, you just lend them credence by debating with them. Uh, but we'd meet in the green room and she'd say, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I became a lawyer, I went to law school because of the women's movement. And I'd say, well, thank you, you're welcome, <laughs> oh, that's really terrific. Then she'd go out there and savage us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's important to point out the, the total, you know, wingeding delusion of their arguments. Um, but it's a thin, thin line between taking them seriously enough to oppose, but, mm -hmm. but not make, taking oh. them so seriously that you dignify them. You know, and it's a, it's a thing to develop. Uh, and I think we developed it during the 60s and 70s, and we've got to revive or develop it anew uh, this time around, because the right is using women in a very clever, cynical way, while the left, God love it, is just ignoring them. <laughs> <laughs> but the right is dehumanizing them. They're making, they're making a joke out of them. Yeah. I mean, when they put these candidates up, it's, it's humiliating. Yeah. But we should have, I don't know, this is where the fun of feminism comes in. We should have, I mean, wherever that list is, as it's, where is it? Is it circulating somewhere? Does it still, I don't want it to get lost in the nether. Okay. Um, I would say a couple of things. We need, we need to bring back, and this is where younger women and older women, the older women who don't give a shit, um, can, the, the Suzanne's fuck you 50s, um, where, where we can really kick out the jams. I mean, we should have little troops of flying feminists who go to the speeches of these women and just laugh. Just laugh hysterically. I mean, get drunk beforehand, or have a puff or two. I mean, whatever you think. Just go and every, just Sharon Engel and say, 
<laughs> you go, sister. Whoa. You know, we need to be outrageous. We need to be audacious again. Um, and I would, uh, I would just ask you to, 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 to really sign that and get a hold of it so it comes back to you. You got, oh, it's there. Okay. Yes. Um, you, can, you can be the, the electric... Um, caucus and be in touch with us. She needs an, a fourth hand in bridge, <laughs> and 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 to and to buy and support these amazing women's books and and to trust each other and to have some fun with this because the myth that feminists have no sense of humor is the single most atrocious lie. If if feminists had no sense of humor, Suzanne and I would have cut our wrists over in the nearest <laughs> basin in 1968. <laughs> Never have I laughed as hard yeah. and as long, and still we meet regularly and we just cackle. Now I know what cackling means. <laughs> so enjoy it. Oh. Enjoy it. Amen. Yay! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. <laughs>